We have been in a series called Trilogy. Trilogy because it's a three-part series. And today is our last week from part number one called Origins. And we've gone through creation. Now we've gone through the fall. We've come to, last week we talked about the covenant. And this week I want to talk about the law. And we find the law in two different places in the Bible. Anybody know where they're at? Bible trilogy, Bible Bible trivia. Anybody? Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 5. And I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. If you need a Bible, there's some Bibles available in the back. If you don't own one, it's our gift to you for you to keep. But Exodus chapter 20, that's where we're going to be at. And... I just want to start out with the very first two verses, and it says this, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Brought you out of Egypt. You you see, there's a, a story behind these verses. There's a lot of things that have happened from the covenant that we talked about in Genesis chapter 12 and 15 with Abram all the way to where the people are standing before God at Mount Sinai. And he says, I brought you out of something. He's he's telling them that there's a story. To understand what God is actually saying here, we got to go back. We got to go back to the beginning. We got to go back to the origin because there's a story that took place. You see, Genesis, you could say, is almost like a prologue to Exodus. Exodus, the people are in Egypt. They're in slavery. And there's a system that they're being born into where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. There's a system where the children are being born into and because Pharaoh is so scared of the Israelites being able to grow in size and numbers that he's taking the males, the babies, and he's throwing them in the Nile River. He's given a command where the army of Egypt is to go and kidnap all the male boys and kill them and dispose of them because he's scared that the Hebrews are going to overpopulate the Egyptians. And so we got to keep them oppressed. We got to keep them down. We have to keep them from being able to grow strong and mighty. You see, with Genesis, what happened was you had the covenant with Abram, and then Abram had a son, Isaac. And God made a covenant with Isaac, and then he made a covenant with Joseph. And Joseph ends up being the second in charge in all of Egypt. There's a famine in the land. And when there's a famine, people come and they start looking for food. So they come down to Egypt, and they find their brother Joseph. And Joseph, God raised up Joseph in order to provide for all the Israelites. But now there's a new Pharaoh. And this new Pharaoh is ruthless. He's oppressive. He's taking the babies and he's killing them. He's making them work harder and longer hours. They are slaves. And what's amazing here is if you look at it in Exodus chapter 2, it says that during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery. They groaned and they cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And so what he's saying is this is a different type of God. You know, in in Egypt, you worshiped those gods. In Egypt, you sacrificed for those gods. In order to get blessed, you had to sacrifice to them. You had to work for them. You had to worship enough, pray enough, sacrifice enough in order to receive the blessing of God. But this is a different type of God what he's saying. This is a different type of relationship. You see, we don't have to necessarily serve God, but God serves us. 
we don't necessarily need to sacrifice to God, but God sacrifices for us. It says he heard the cries of the oppressed. He heard the misery that they were going through. He heard his people and was listening to his people where he said, I'm going to come down and free them. I'm going to come down and I'm going to take them out. I'm going to come down and deliver them. And that's where the story starts. And we need to start there because the truth is we often think of the Ten Commandments as a whole bunch of lists of do and don'ts. Like, I can do this, but I can't do this. It's God trying to regulate my life. He's trying to control my life. He's trying to ruin all my fun, right? God's just limiting me. He's holding me back. But the Ten Commandments is something so much rich. It's richer and deeper. And the reason being is because he starts out by saying, do you remember when you were oppressed? When you, do you remember when you were hurting? Do you remember when you were praying that prayer? Do you remember when you were calling out my name? Do you remember what you were going through? I'm the God that listens. I'm the God that hears. I'm the God that responds. I'm the God that freed you and took you out of there. So now they're standing before Mount Sinai. And God gives them a list. Well, what is this list? It's amazing how... If you can throw it up on the screen, Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2, he says, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. He took you out of Egypt. This Hebrew word for took, we find in several other places of the Bible. It's interesting where we find it. I'm just going to read you a couple verses. In Genesis eleven twenty nine. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. Took wives for themselves. Or Genesis 21, 21, where it says, Ishmael took a woman from Egypt to be his wife. Or Genesis 24, 67, where it says, Isaac took Rebekah as his wife. And he loved her. Or we have Genesis 26, 34, where Esau took women as wives from the Hittites and from the Ishmaelites. Or even 2 Samuel 11, where it says David took Bathsheba to be his wife. God is saying, I took you from Egypt. And he uses the same word that's described in the Bible as a wedding ceremony. You see, I brought you out of Egypt in order to be my bride. I brought you out of Egypt in order to be my people. And so the Ten Commandments is not a list of do's and don'ts. The Ten Commandments is not a set of regulations. The Ten Commandments is a list. It's not a list of rules, but a set of vows. It's a wedding ceremony that's taken place. That's what's going on here. And the Jewish people would have recognized it because there's four different things that go into a wedding ceremony. But I want you to think about this at first. This is what God is doing here. This is the type of God they serve. They're used to sacrificing and trying to please the gods. And this is a God who says, you don't have to sacrifice in order to please me. I brought you out of Egypt so we could be together. I brought you out of Egypt so we could be married. I brought you out of Egypt because I value you and love you and cherish you. This is a different type of relationship with the God that we have, the Israelite God, the Christian God versus all the other gods that people worship. This is a God who wants a wedding. He wants to enter into a ceremony with you. Now, think about it. Why do we get married? Why do we get married? Why, why do we go through the process of actually getting married? Some people will say it's out of love. Maybe responsibility. But the truth of the matter is because you want to be with that person. 
You cherish that person. You value that person. You love that person. You can't think of, I want to be with anybody else. I want to be with you for the rest of my life. I want to be one with you. That's what God is doing here. And we see it because there's four different aspects. And we have to understand a little bit about history, you know, to understand how a Jewish wedding took place. But the four items that go into a Jewish wedding is number one, a mikvah. There was a mikvah. Now, if you are taking notes, you can write it down. M-I-K-V-A-H is a mikvah. That means that it is, there's a cleansing that takes place to prepare for the ceremony. Now, when a girl gets married today, what do you do? You go and you buy a dress. You go and do your hair. You do your makeup. You coordinate. There's months of preparation that goes into a wedding, right? There's a preparation that takes place. You're not just going to show up after you've worked in the fields all day. You're not just going to go and show up in your regular casual clothes. No, you put on your best. Often the men have a tuxedo. The women have bridesmaids dresses. Their shoes have been coordinated. They're all the way down to the jewelry. Every single detail has been planned. And there's a cleansing that takes place. There's a preparation that takes place. It's interesting how we see in Exodus 19 verses 10 through 14 that there's this cleansing that takes place and it says and the lord said to moses go to the people and consecrate them prepare them wash them have them clean themselves consecrate them today and tomorrow have them wash their clothes you see there's a preparation and be ready for the third day because why because on that day The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And what's he going to do? Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. He's saying, don't mock the ceremony. Don't mock the process. This is something beautiful. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean for this beautiful ceremony that's going to take place. The people would have instantly understood that God is up to something. Not just did they have a mikvah, but they also had, number two, you had to have a chupa for an Israelite wedding. A chupa. Well, what's a chupa? It was a covering. It was a canopy. Often when two people would be married, they would stand under a, what they would call a prayer shawl. There would be four poles, and then this prayer shawl over them. And then after their wedding, they would take this prayer shawl into their bedroom and they would hang it behind them on the wall or they would use it as a covering on the bed. But it was a reminder of what they were entering into. This covering or literally can be translated as they stood under the mountain. Look at what it says in Exodus 19, verse 17. This covering. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. When God came down, he covered with the cloud. He covered over them. He becomes the canopy for the people. When he meets with the people, he's covering over them, covering over them for protection covering over them as their God, covering over them as a bride comes down the aisle and she meets her husband, the groom, for the very first time. They're standing before an altar. They're standing before the chupa. And God is covering over them as a bride would for his wife, as as a husband would for his wife, as a groom would for the bride. God is there to protect his people. And then he enters into this beautiful ceremony. You see, I want you to see that the Ten Commandments is not a list of rules, but a set of vows. Is the Ten Commandments a set, just a list of rules, or does it reveal something about God? Because the third thing that we see here is that in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, he gives out 10 different, not just rules, but 10 different rules 
vows. Ten different vows that he enters into. Let's read them together. Maybe some of you know the Ten Commandments. Maybe they're actually, you, you have them memorized. But let's read through Genesis or Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And we can, it'll be on the screen. We can do this together. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse number three. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself, this is commandment number two, an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God and jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day. By keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all the work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath due to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner reading, residing, residing, not reading. They didn't read. They did read, but they residing, okay? Residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and on the earth and the sea and all that was in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I love that commandment because I often tell my kids, listen, I brought you into this world and I can take you out just as easy, okay? Honor your father and, amen, right? Honor your father and your mother so your life will be long because I can shorten it real quick. <laughs> Commandment number six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. See, these aren't just a set of rules. This is a revelation about God. I want you to think about this. If I was entering into a marriage set ceremony, what would that look like? If I stood before my bride and I just created a contract, if I said, you know what, I'm the first, I will pay my half of the rent, but you need to pay yours. I'm, some, some people, I might start stepping on toes because some of you might have marriages like this. What if it was like a relationship where we're just roommates? You pay for your half of the phone bill. I pay for my half of the phone bill. In fact, when I buy a gallon of milk, I'm going to label it Chris's milk. And I'm going to put it right there on the top shelf. Don't you touch my milk. What? What? You have your car. I have mine. You have your bills. I have mine. And we're going to split the kids right down the half. You know, you spend two hours with them. I spend two. And we begin to divide it up equally. And it's like a contract. If you please me, I will give my body to you. If you don't please me, don't even come looking. You see, what if we entered into relationships where it's, if you do this, I will do this. But that's not what we see in a marriage, is it? That's not what we should see in a Christian marriage, at least. Because a Christian marriage says that you are one flesh. A Christian marriage, you can't divide the two. Where you enter into a covenant with each other, you're saying, let no man separate what God has joined together because you are now one. Everything I have, she owns. And everything she owns, I possess. You see, we are in this together. One family, one unit, one marriage, one covenant that we're to enter into. 
And that's what God is saying with his people. When he enters into these vows, we can look at it not as a list of rules, but as a revelation of who God is, what he wants the relationship to be. It's not God trying to ruin all your fun. I want to change your perspective this morning about the the covenant, the wedding that God wants to enter into with you. And when he gives the list of rules, which is the the ketaba, it's a written contract, it's a marriage agreement, it's the vows that the, the couple is entering into. You know the vows that you say, I will love you, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Now, what if we were to say, you know what? Let's, let's just put a temporary contract on this. Let, let's put a contract where we're going to enter into a temporary marriage, and after two years, if things aren't going my way or how I want that, I can just get out. It's just null and void, but you know what? If things are going really good, we'll just renew the contract. We'll, ju- we'll just keep it going for another two years until things aren't... See, that's not what marriage is about. Marriage, when you're entering into these vows, you, sometimes you're going to be richer and sometimes you're going to be poor. Sometimes there's going to be help, but sometimes there's going to be sickness. You're using the extreme to say whatever circumstance we're facing, whatever we're going through, we're going to go through this together. We're going to get through it together. Whether things are going good or things are going bad, we got each other and that's all we need. That's what marriage is about. We need to resurrect the Christian idea of marriage today, where it's not, I'm just going to leave my spouse because things aren't going my way, but no, I'm going to sacrifice and serve in all circumstance because we are one team. And that's what God does for us. God comes to us and he enters into this ketaba, this written vow, and it reveals who he is. It reveals his character. It's not a set of rules, but it's a set of revelation. Look at, look at even verse number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Is God being controlling? Is God being legalistic? Is God saying and setting the limits because he's a tyrant? Or is he saying... I love you so much that I can't stand you running around on me. I love you so much that I want such a close relationship with you. I don't want to share you with anybody else. Who would want to share their spouse? Who would want to share their partner in a marriage? Not me, amen. That's my wife. That's my woman. Don't even look at her. That's what God is saying. I cherish and possess you so much. I don't want anybody else chasing after you. I'm going to chase after you. I'm going to love you. And I want you to look at me in the same way. That's God's desire. He doesn't want us cheating on him because he loves us so much. That's why he says don't have any other God's before me it's a revelation to his character it's a revelation to who he is what about commandment number two you shall not make or worship any gods Yahweh says now that I'm your number one lover don't dwell on your former lovers don't go back to your old ways of Egypt don't go worshiping other gods why because we're in this relationship together don't go back to your past boyfriends Don't look them up on Facebook. You married me. You entered into a relationship with me. That's what God is saying. Don't go back to your former past. Continue to love me. Continue to work at the relationship with me. We often say, well, the grass is greener on the other side. I love what Craig Groeschel says about this. He says, if the grass is greener on the other side, we shouldn't be looking at the other side. We should be taking care of our own yard. Amen? We need to add a little bit of fertilizer. We need to trim the hedges. We need to line them up straight. 
We need to do some work in our marriages instead of looking at the other side. If the grass is greener, then pay attention to your own yard. Amen? Focus on it. Do devotions together. Pray together. Spend time together. I love what Revelation 2 says. God's talking to the churches. He's talking to the seven churches. And he comes to the very first church and he says, man, you've done some awesome things. The church of Ephesus. You guys are knocking out of the park when it comes to service. You guys are bringing people to Jesus. You guys are doing awesome things. But you've forgotten one thing. One thing I hold against you is you've forgotten your first love. And he says, do the things you did at first. You see, I tell people all the time, if you've fallen out of love with your person, love is a feeling. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love is not a feeling. It's an action. We in today's culture believe it's a feeling. I'm sorry. Feelings are produced by actions. And the things you did at first, by bringing that girl flowers, by paying attention to him on the phone, by making him dinner and feeding him well, because the way to a guy's heart is through his stomach, right? And so the things you did at first... The actions, the sacrifices, the staying up late, the communicating, they produce feelings. If you've fallen out of love, it's because you're no longer doing the actions. He says, do the things you did at first. You see, when God comes and he creates these vows, he's saying, I want to be your lover. I want to be only you. I mean, look at vow number four. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What he's saying is, I want to spend time with you. Take one day out of the week to spend time with me. I mean, in a relationship, if we don't spend time together, what happens? We fall and drift apart, right? And life throws a whole bunch of things our way. Distraction after distraction. Kids get in the way. Jobs get in the way. Work. All good things, but they're distractions from the relationship. So I tell people, you need to take a date night. You need to schedule it. You need to plan it. You need to put it on the calendar. You need to spend time together. That's what God's saying. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He's saying, I want to spend time with you. I want to be with you. When's the last time you took time outside just today to spend some time with God? Do you see God only once a week at church? A lot of times it's not even that. Do you see God once a month when you actually show up to church? Do you see God every single day? Do you get up in the morning and you give them a phone call? Because when you're in love with somebody, what do you do? The first thing you want to do in the morning and before you go to sleep is you call that person and you say hello. You lay down and you say goodnight. You say I love you. Do you get up in the morning and you spend time with God? Do you go to bed and spend time with God? At lunchtime, do you take some time out of the day and say, I'm going to go back and spend some time with God? Are we spending time with God? Because God says, I want to spend time with you. I want to be with you. Take some time out of your day. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Why? Because he knew we would get so busy that we would ignore him, that we would do life without him, that we would pursue other things, even though they're good, that we're workaholics. And he says relationship is more important. And so all of these are revelations about who God is. They're revelations about his character. Commandment number five, have respect for your parents. What he's saying is respect authority. Value authority, cherish authority. Why? Because authority has wisdom. People who have been there before you. People who have done things and shown discernment. And God is one who is wise. God is one who has wisdom. And he says, come to me and respect my authority. Why? Because I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to bless you. I'm not trying to keep you from things. I'm trying to show you things. And he says, respect your parents. Why? Because God is the ultimate parent. He says, have and show respect to authority. Why? Because they want to help you. I tell my kids this all the time. You think your friends have your best interest at heart? I said, did your friends sacrifice like I sacrificed? Did your friends get up with you in the middle of the night and take care of you when you were sick? Did your friends invest the amount of money that I've invested into you? I said, why are you not going to listen to my advice? I have the best at heart for you. I want to see you succeed. I've invested in your life. Why would I want to see you fail? God says the same thing. He says, what type of good parent would give their kid a rock or a serpent? No. A good parent cares for their child. A good parent gives wisdom to their child. A good parent wants to see their child succeed. So he says, 
Honor your father and your mother. Now, I know because we're sinners, some of us haven't had good fathers and mothers. But God is saying he is the ultimate father. And if we follow his ways, then hopefully we'll have some good sets of parents. If we follow his ways, hopefully he'll set us up for success. There's no perfection. And then he continues on, do not murder. Why? Because God values life. You see, again, these are character revelations, not a set of rules, but revelation to who God is. He values life. He's the giver of life, not death. Or don't commit adultery. What he's saying is don't run around on me. Don't cheat on me. Or you shall not steal. Why would you need to steal when the provider gives you all of your needs? Why would you need to take when we have the giver providing for everything for us? You see, it's a revelation that you need to trust God. You need to believe in God. You need to believe in the provider that he's going to give you, maybe not everything you want, but everything that you need in his timing. And when we trust and we believe in that, he's trying to set who he is. I'm your provider. You don't need to steal from each other. You don't need to take because I'm the one that gives you what you need. Or vow number nine, you shall not bear false witness. Why? Because God always tells the truth. That's who he is. He's the truth teller. Or number 10, you shall not covet. Why? Because you don't need what your neighbor has. You need to just focus on what I'm giving you, my relationship with you. Don't desire what they have. Desire what I can give you. You see, he enters into these vows, but there's a fourth thing that was missing. A fourth sign that was missing. But before we go to that fourth sign, before we go to that fourth thing of a wedding, I think this is a beautiful picture of marriage where David Ireland was diagnosed with neurological disease that put him in a wheelchair as a teenager. But he was still able to go to college and even get married. When his wife got pregnant and they were going to have their first child, he was a little bit concerned that he wasn't going to live to see his child be born. So he decided to write a book. The book is called Letters to an Unborn Child. And in it, he writes this about his wife. This is the kind of woman... Your mother is. When we go on a date, she puts me in the bathtub. She brushes my teeth. She dresses me. She puts me in a wheelchair. She puts the pedestals of the chair so I can rest my legs. She pushes me down the steps out of the car. She pulls me out of the wheelchair. She puts me in the car. She closes the door. She puts my wheelchair in the trunk, and she closes the trunk and raises the garage Door. Now remember, back then, these weren't automatic doors. These were manual doors that go up and down in the 60s. She backs out of the garage. She pulls the garage door back down. She drives me to the restaurant. She gets out of the restaurant. She goes to the trunk. She gets the wheelchair out of the trunk. She pulls the chair up to the side of the car. She puts me in the wheelchair. She closes the door. She closes the trunk. She pushes me into the restaurant. She pushes me to the table. She puts me in the chair at the table so I'll be more comfortable and people won't be prone to stare. She feeds me. She wipes my chin. She pays for the meal. She puts me back in the wheelchair. She pushes me back out of the car. She puts me in the car. She puts the wheelchair back in the trunk. She drives us home. She raises the garage door. Man, this is exhausting just even reading this, let alone doing it. She pulls into the garage. She takes the wheelchair out of the trunk. She puts me in the chair. She closes the trunk, closes the garage door, takes my clothes off, puts me in pajamas, brushes my teeth. She puts me to bed, kisses me on the cheek, and says, thank you for taking me out to dinner. Thank you for taking me out to dinner. You see, this is our relationship with God. He enters into a wedding ceremony with us. He cleans us up. He washes us off. He consecrates us. He enters into vows with us. And then he says, thank you for being in relationship. He dies for us. He spills his blood for us. He does everything for us. And then he comes and says, thank you. For being in relationship. You see, the fourth thing of a wedding was a sign. Was a sign. 
the fourth thing in a Jewish wedding was a sign. We have signs today. Often we wear rings as a sign that I'm married. Other people look at my hand. They see that I'm married. I'm taken. I belong to somebody. I belong to my bride. She belongs to me. We wear these rings as a symbol to the rest of the world as a sign that we're in a relationship together. We've made vows together. We've entered into a marriage together. People say all the time, I'm looking for a sign. Where is my sign? Where's my sign, God? I'm praying for a sign. I'm going to tell you your sign. The same way the people and Israelites needed a sign to see that they were sealed and they were married and they received the Ten Commandments, they received a sign in Exodus 31, 16, and 17. Here's what it says. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. That's their sign. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and he was refreshed. They needed a sign to see that they were married. Well, where's our sign? Luke chapter two, verse 12 says, this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. You want to see your sign? Your sign is that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was born as a baby. He was raised perfectly. He lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross for your sins. You want to see a sign that God loves you? He spilled his blood for you. You want to see that God cherishes you, that he wants to marry you? He came into this world, and he sacrificed everything for you. He cleaned you up, spilled his blood, took your sins, died on the the cross and at the same time he comes and says i want to have a relationship with you you see jesus is our sign the cross is our sign you want to see that god loves you that's our sign that jesus came into this world for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life our sign is jesus you see the ten commandments the law is not a set of rules, but it's about a relationship. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be married to you. He says, you, the church, are the bride of Christ. You, the church, are my beloved. You, the church, even though he cleans us up, even though he dies for us, even though he sacrifices, he says, thank you for having a relationship with me. He opened the doorway. He wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want just you to pull them out when you have a whole list of things that you want in life. No, he's not a genie in a bottle. No, he is your groom and we are his bride. He wants a relationship. Romans 10, 8, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's how he enters into a relationship with us. We confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart. I'm going to ask for you to bow your heads as we close. Because maybe there's somebody in here that I have full faith that you're saying, you know what? I haven't had this relationship before in my life. I don't know what that means to have a relationship with God like that. I know that God exists up there, but do I talk to God every single day? Do I cherish and value him the same way? Do I know that I am cherished and loved by God? Do I believe that I'm really married to God as close as my spouse, physically, emotionally, intimately? Because God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows every hair that's on your head, and he wants a relationship with you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus' words. I stand at the door and knock. And whoever opens that door, I will come in and eat with him and then with me. See, he'll eat with you. He'll dine with you because he wants a relationship with you. If that's you today, you want to enter into a brand new relationship with God, all you do is have to pray. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. If you're watching online, you can do this right in your living room. You can do this right in your car. Just pull over for a moment and pray these words. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe 
that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I want to walk with you. I want to eat with you. I'm opening the doors of my heart and I'm inviting you in. I want to follow you the rest of my days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If that was you, the Bible says that you're a new creation. The Bible says that there is a party going on in heaven and we want to celebrate with you. The same way we're going to party outside with our baptisms is we want to party with you because the angels are already partying in heaven. And so would you let us know would you just fill out that power card and, and let us know or let one of our first impressions know or come up to me after the service and say, I prayed that prayer because we want to walk beside you as a church family. You're not alone in your faith. You're not alone in this spiritual journey. We're a family that's walking together, imperfect, but walking with God's perfect plan.